morning to each one of you. I am glad you're here, and for those of you who are visiting for the first time, I trust that you enjoy the company of the saints, and at the same time, really feel welcome here this morning. If you are looking for a place, a community of faith, you're always welcome to join Cornerstone International Community Church. Before I start the sermon, I wanted to say thank you again to all of you. In case you weren't here last week, or in case I have not approached you to say my personal thanks, you have been so richly uh, a part of how we have felt so welcome in California. I was given a list by Atelus just this week, and I saw the list of all those who have given to welcome us here in the church. And I was surprised to see, I think, three yellow pages you know, of names. And that must be all of you. So on behalf of my family, thank you so much for, for your gifts and for your love for us. I trust that we'd be able to repay somehow your love to us, but I know uh, that might not be possible because you're just too big and what you've given is far beyond what I could imagine. We've been looking at our mission for the church, and it's simply put together in these three words. We gather, we pray, and we go. That's about it, right? One of the things that I was really, really grateful to God for when I saw the church was that my first encounters with people in the office were prayer warriors. I mean, they were there praying. They were there seeking the Lord Himself. They were there pleading to God for His mercy. They were there worshiping the Lord for who He is, and that is fantastic. Prayers, warriors on Tuesday and Friday, and prayer meeting on Wednesday night, it is fantastic. I trust that we get into the groove of really praying for one another and enjoying the Lord's favor upon us. You know, once there were two friends who were walking by the countryside, and as they were walking, they suddenly were in front of a raging bull. And the bull just simply trained its eyes on them, almost with smoke coming out of its nostrils. And it began to paw its feet, at, you know, like it was ready to pounce on these two strangers who suddenly were in its territory. And so the two friends began to panic. And one friend said to the other, Pray! Pray quickly! The only way we can get out of this alive is for prayer. And the other friend said, Oh my goodness, I don't even know how to pray. I've never prayed in my life. Just pray whatever. And he said, The only prayer I know is the one that I heard from my dad. Just pray. We're going to die if you don't pray. And so he prayed and he said, Lord, for whatever we are about to receive, help us to be truly thankful. <laughs> The prayer sometimes is like a convenience outlet, a convenience store. We say it is convenient, it is close, and it can go anytime, but it's also cheap. That's what prayer is, isn't it? Well, prayer indeed is what we're looking at today. Prayer is like, to me, a key to the riches that God has in store. Last week, we said the heartbeat of our gathering is Jesus. But you see, even if Jesus is our treasure, there is something we need in order to access that treasure. The access to the treasure is as important as the treasure itself. If we don't have access to the riches that is ours, that treasure really is useless to us. And that key to unlock the riches that is Jesus is none other than prayer. Without that key, we miss out on the riches of that treasure. And so if Jesus is everything to us, then prayer is the key to enjoying the treasure that is Jesus. Our Tori had this to say, prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. All that God is and all that God has is at the disposal of prayer. But let me say this. Not all praying is affirmed by Jesus. He condemns much of the praying that goes on in the world. And he even condemns sometimes prayers of the saints. He condemns prayers even in the church. 
And therefore, we as his followers need to take to heart what the differences are between what is correct and right prayer and what could be prayers that are condemned by Jesus. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 6 to understand this teaching better. Matthew 6, of course, is the Lord's Prayer. You know that very well, right? But the immediate context is found in the first verse. If you look at verse 1, it says something like this. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Now, three particular examples are given in this passage, right? Three acts. And the first act is that of charity, giving. The second is praying, and the third is fasting. Apparently, these three acts of piety, external righteousness, are the most susceptible to faking it, according to Jesus. It's easy to fake holiness by giving. It's easy to fake my righteousness by praying. Easy to fake my goodness by fasting. So today we'll look at praying and what's fake and what's genuine. So follow me in your outline with you at the back of your bulletins. Jesus continues on, how not to pray? And I call that religious praying. And I will let you know why I call it religious praying is not the way to pray. And so first two verses, verses five and six, our prayers are not to be hypocritical, but they are to be truthful. Verse 5 says, And when you pray, Jesus says, You are not to be as hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners in order to be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. Verse 6, But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will repay you. Now, you know that word hypocrite, it's actually also the Greek word, hypocrite. So the English word truly comes from the Greek word, hypocrite. Back in those days, hypocrite was a good word. It's not the bad word that we know today, it was a good word. Do you know why? Well, it's actually used 18 times in the Bible. But the hypocrite back in those days referred to an actor or an actress or a stage player. In other words, when we are involved in a stage play, say we're doing a play on Shakespeare, or we're doing an Easter cantata, or a Christmas cantata, right? All the actors and actresses are hypocrites. <laughs> Again, that's the literal word. Instead of saying actor, actress, they said, oh, they're hypocrites. And you know what the word really means? The word literally means to hide underneath to be underneath something and you understand the meaning because back in those days in the new testament when you're a hypocrite an actor or an actress when you went on stage you actually wore a big mask and the mask that you wore was actually for the people to differentiate one actor after the other you see you wear a mask so that they know oh well he's playing dario rick rick of Franca. <laughs> oh, he, he, he's playing Nilo Gatos. You know, they, they need a big mask because they all look the same. Don't they look the same? <laughs> right? They, they need a mask to differentiate. And so those actors were playing behind the mask their own characters. Now, when Jesus used the word hypocrite, back in those days, that was a good word, but he says this. He actually means this. Don't wear a mask when you pray. Don't act when you pray. Don't pretend when you pray. Don't use prayer as if you're showing off. Don't pray in order to perform. Amen. Don't pray when all you want is the applause of men. Don't pray when your motive for praying is for others to say, Wow, our senior pastor is such a prayerful guy. Wow, these people are so prayerful. We ought to have a prayer seminar for all the world to see how good we are in praying. If that is your motive, Jesus says, forget it. You have your reward in full. In fact, the reward in full is actually the applause you get. You got it. 
So the extended meaning of the first line person wearing a figurative mask and pretending to be someone or something that they are not. So it's a disguise. And the hypocrite is someone who pretends to be morally good, morally pious, in order to deceive others. Unfortunately, their love is not for prayer, but for themselves. Their love is for themselves and the applause they get when they pray in public. Their love is not for God who hears them when they pray. Their love is for the people to see them and clap when they pray. And say, what is this? Beneath the mask of piety lurk their pride. And that's what it is. Right? What they really wanted was a pause and they got it. Now, how often then, or how then should followers of Jesus pray? Jesus said simply, go into your inner room, shut the door, and pray. Now certainly, we must shut the door against disturbance, we shut the door against distraction and all of that, but also, we shut out the prying eyes of men in order to shut ourselves in with God. The prying eyes. Be careful of the eyes that pry on you to watch you. Jesus says that the Father is in that secret place. He's there to welcome us when we pray to Him. Therefore, nothing destroys prayer like side glances. Nothing destroys prayer like side glances at human spectators. But nothing also enriches prayer like a sense of the presence of the divine spectator, God Himself, who is eager to listen to us. So God not only sees the one who is praying, but here's the point of it all, not only does He see us when we pray, but more than that, He sees the heart that prays, He sees the motive of praying. And that is what's more important than the act of praying. He sees the motive. We see Jesus' intention for His followers to pray in secret. You know, praying in private doesn't mean that they shouldn't get involved in prayer meetings. It doesn't mean that we should pray together. It doesn't mean that there is no corporate prayer. I mean, just look at this prayer. Our Father. Right? That means that's us. We are praying together. Our Father. So it doesn't necessarily mean pray in our own secret locker rooms all by ourselves. You in your cubicle, me in my cubicle, you in the other cubicle, and we pray separately, but it sounds like we're all praying together. No, no, no. That's not the point. Jesus' point is simply this. When he says, pray in secret, make sure that your motives in praying are pure. Pray together. Pray with the public at large. But make sure your motive is pure. Not to win the praises of men and the applause that you get by showing, showing off your righteousness. So we are to pray out of a genuine love for God. And then we use the exercise of prayer as a pious cloak to hide our love for ourselves. I remember a story of a, a zoo. And in the zoo, the popular thing about the zoo was a gorilla. The gorilla was the main attraction. But suddenly the gorilla passed away. No gorilla. They had only one gorilla. And so the company that owned the zoo said, oh, this is a problem. I mean, this is our main attraction. He said, you manager, you do something about this. And the manager said, what am I going to do? I don't want to do. He went to an employee, asked the employees, who wants to act like a gorilla? Put on a gorilla costume. And guess what? $100 a day extra if you play the gorilla. Well, one of them did. Said, I need some money. And so he wore the gorilla costume. He sat there on his own cage. And the people saw, oh, look at that gorilla. Looks, looks like a gorilla indeed. And so they, they said, after a while, that main attraction is getting dull. And it's getting dry. The gorilla is not moving. And so the manager said to this guy, you got to do something, guy. You, know, you can't just sit there, do something like a gorilla does. And so he began to scratch his head. He began to you know, roar a little bit. And uh, he did what gorilla, gorillas do. Until finally, you know, the, the audience, you know, the people, got tired as well. Is that what this gorilla can do? And so the manager says, do something more. And so he did. 
you know, he saw a trapeze flying. And so he said, no, I'm good at that. I'm athletic. And so he climbed, put his hands onto the bar of that trapeze, and he began to sway left and right, back and forth. And the people said, wow, what a gorilla. I mean, there's no such gorilla he can do that. This guy is a pro. Well, suddenly one day he was doing this thing and he was really very confident about this thing and suddenly his hand slipped and he found himself falling into a lion's den. <laughs> and the people were watching and he said, oh, they were scared because a gorilla with a lion, what's going to happen here? And the lion began to come closer and closer to the gorilla. And as the lion came closer and closer, the gorilla began to shout, Help! <laughs> Help! Now, people began to, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like a gorilla. Help! Help! And he began to shout because he was desperate until the lion came running towards the gorilla. And when the lion got to the gorilla, the lion said, What are you trying to do? Get us both fired? <laughs> Showing off. <laughs> Jesus says, all these things, you know, you stand in the corner because the Jewish priests did that. They go to the wailing wall because they do that. They go to the synagogues and they pray. It's religious. It's what they do. I mean, they're people of the cloth. And so you expect me to pray because I should be a person of the cloth, right? But you see how vulnerable we all are. Just because it's expected of you, you do it. You see, that even that is a wrong motive. And Jesus said, all these religious praying, it's not good. It's hypocritical. Be truthful, he says. Well, there's a second thing he says here. Your prayers ought not to be mechanical, but it ought to be thoughtful. Verse 7 and 8. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. Verse 8. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now, what does that mean, that phrase, meaningless repetition? You see, that word is one word in Greek, not two words. One word. And it's only used one time in the New Testament, and therefore it is not so easy to understand what that word means. Meaningless repetition. Obviously, we repeat our prayers, don't we? I mean, we keep on praying for something. We keep on praying for someone. And there is a point where we need to persevere in prayer, right? So we repeat prayers. So what does it mean, meaningful repetition? Well, the word might be an onomatopoeia. <laughs> what? Onomatopoeia. You know, words like, their meanings come from the sound of the word, like, bang! What does that mean? Bang! The sound itself reveals its meaning. Boom! The word itself means what it sounds. And so it's similar to Greek. This word goes like this. Batalogic. Batalogic. What is that? Exactly. What is that word? Exactly. Batalogic. What is that word? It simply means... What are you talking about? What are you saying? Right? It's full of words, but I don't get what you're saying. Don't go babbling on like the pagans. It is to be verbose. It is to use so many words, but without meaning. Just continuous rattling on. All noise, no real communication, no communion taking place. And therefore, the next line exposed the folly of such pretense of praying. They suppose that they will be heard for their many words. They won't. We don't need to have so many prayers. Our prayers need not be 24 hour marathon, filling in the air waves. Right? Just like in radio, you know, when when we see the sign on air, oh we have to keep talking. Sometimes we talk nonsense, but we have to fill in the airwaves. Prayer isn't that way. Otherwise you're just rattling on and Jesus says they know that I already know what they need even before they pray. <coughs> wow. 
So it's not about repetitive prayers per se. Jesus himself repeated himself in prayer, especially in the Garden of Gethsemane. He went into the garden three times, you remember? He checked on the apostles, they were asleep. Went back, said the same prayer. And so what's being condemned is speaking without thinking. So it cannot be mechanical or without thought. It cannot be we're praying, but our minds are parked somewhere else. But they too need to be converging. So, is it, is it possible that we are guilty of this kind of praying? In many ways, I am. And perhaps, in many ways, the church is. We approach God with the lips where the heart is far from Him. It's equally possible to use empty phrases, to lapse into religious words while the mind wanders. Remember, what Jesus forbids is any kind of prayer with the mouth when the mind is disengaged. When the mind is dis so what do we do with Korean praying? You have, have you heard of this? Yes. You know, we, we pray the Korean way. And what it means is, we pray aloud all together. And sometimes we have to shout because you can't hear yourself. But it's all together praying and it's all aloud and sometimes it's really loud. It's noise. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. Please, please, don't say that, oh, Pastor Carlos said Korean praying is wrong. Pastor Carlos said, well, speaking in tongues is entirely wrong. What I'm saying is this. Prayer of the mind and the lips need to go together. And if you can't pray simply because you can't hear yourself, then that's not good for me. Speaking in tongues, sometimes people force you to just open your mouth and say whatever right it, it, it's manipulative and therefore your, your mind is disengaged you you somehow place your mind in the toilet and you go out and you try to do something that is somehow disconnected to who you are and jesus says watch out that's not the kind of prayer that is affirmed by me what does this all say about our lord himself you see, God Himself is a personal God. God is a loving God. God is a living God. And therefore, our prayers to Him reveal our theology. How we pray actually shows what we think God is. Don't you think? How we pray reveals in part our understanding of who God is. You see, if you come to God with magic and mantra, thinking that He will only listen to you with smoke, then it reveals what you believe about your God. Doesn't it? If you come to God and you need to somehow bang the doors and shout out loud and somehow make noise in order to wake Him from slumber, then your God is dead. But this God that Jesus says, He says, Our Father, Lord, how will thy kingdom come, thy will be done? This is not our Father. He's a loving God. A living God, a personal God. You know, I remember a church. A church came together to pray together because in the community, someone somehow decided to build the first bar in the community. The first gentleman's club near the church. And so the church people got together and they prayed out loud to God. Lord, do not make this thing happen. Lord, let not this corruption happen in our community. Lord, etc., etc. Suddenly there was a bolt of lightning that hit the bar and it burned to the ground. And the owner of the bar sued the church. <laughs> what? They're responsible. And so the church also got their own lawyer and battled it out in court. And the church said, we're not responsible. <coughs> and the owner of the bar said, they're responsible. And the judge said in the end, one thing is clear. The bar owner believes in prayer. The church doesn't believe in prayer. <laughs> I mean, did the church pray? You see, our prayers reveal who God is. So how do we pray? What does Jesus say? This is real prayer. Pray then in this way, verse 9. 
pray then in this way. So it's like a guide. It's like an example. But in Luke chapter 11, a parallel passage of the Lord's Prayer. In Luke it says, when you pray, say this prayer. Here, it is an example. It is a guide. In Luke, these are the words you actually pray. In other words, we can look at this prayer as a guide, as an example. But at the same time, we can pray this prayer out loud with a heart, with thought, with truth. And so here, a pattern, a format, and we find a form of prayer. And here's what I find out. This prayer takes away the focus from love of self, from individualism, to a love for God. What is real prayer? First, it seeks God's glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know that place, our Father in heaven, heavenly Father. Yes, it is a place. Yes, God is in heaven. We are on earth. But it's more than a place. When we say in heaven, it actually refers to His power and His authority, His rule. Similar to what we do today. Similar to what we hear in the news in, in, in CNN or Fox News or whichever you like. I, I, I guess there's a divide here, some are Fox, some are CNN. Never mind. But when you hear them and there's a broadcaster, he says, she says, according to Washington, according to the White House, what do you mean according, according to the place? No, it's according to the seat of power. It's according to that authority, right? And so when we pray our Father in heaven, He's not only in heaven, we're saying our Father who has authority and power. That's the kind of Father that we have. And so when we say our Father who art in heaven, not only we're saying God, you're a loving God, God, you're a living God, God, you're a personal God, but God, you are a powerful God. Hallowed be thy name. God's name, God's character, His activity. You see, He is already holy. Hallowed be thy Holy be your name. He is separated from us. He's far distinguished and different from us. He's highly exalted over other name that we can even think about. And so our prayer is that He may be treated as holy. How would it, may your name be treated holy, first of all, by me. You're already holy, Lord. May your name be treated as holy by the church. You're already holy, Lord. May your name be treated as holy in the world. Of course, we don't see that in the world. Sometimes we don't even see that in the church. And of course, we often do not don't see that in our own life. That's the prayer we make when we say, Hallowed be thy name. We seek the glory of God. But there's more than this. We do God's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So just as God is already holy, He is already king. Thy kingdom come where you are king. He is reigning in absolute sovereignty over both nature and history. He's not only God of the universe, this created order, He is the God of time. He is the God of the progress of time. He is the God of history, of eternity. From day one until day of completion, He is in charge. And so when Jesus came here on earth, what happened? He announced the breaking in of God's rule in our lives. And when He broke in God's rule, we receive the blessings of salvation. We receive the demands of His Lordship. Jesus is Lord. And so to pray, Thy kingdom come. What does that mean? It is to see the progress and the growth of God's rule. May we see Your kingdom more. May we see Your rule more and more. And how does that happen? It's through the witness of His church. And then to its consummation when Jesus returns in His glory. That's how God's rule will be prayed about and brought to consummation. But there's more. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What Jesus bids us pray is that life on earth, our lives here on earth, 
it might approximate more nearly life in heaven. Ah, that's powerful. That is powerful. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. My life here on earth approximates what it ought to be in heaven. Now that prayer is revolutionary. That prayer is countercultural. Why? You see, when we pray this prayer truthfully, thoughtfully, we're doing something big. And here it is. We are rearranging our priorities. Not my will, not what I want, but what you want, Lord. Now, why is that big? And it's easy to say I rearrange my priority. And we go out of here. You see, there's a relentless battle to conform the self-centeredness of secular culture. It's a battle. It's constant. It's relentless. We so easily become concerned about our own little name. Why do I know? Of course. I want to have selfies with, you know, Stephen Curry. And upload that as quickly as I can. And I say, that's Stephen Curry. You see the glory? But that's me beside you. There's a little bit of glory as well. I see that in my business cards and all the titles I have and credentials in my business cards and I keep giving up. Remember me when you're in paradise of money. I know that because I just keep on making friends of everyone on Facebook just to say I have a million friends. And I got a thousand connections on LinkedIn. It's my own little name. Well, easily brought into that and more than that when my name is maligned when my name is attacked I go to court to clear my name you see it's all about our name you go out there it's about your name it's about you making a name out there now you might have a name but maybe it's because of God giving you a name for his glory amen amen Amen. See, sometimes we're more concerned with our name than God's name. Not only that, we become obsessed with our empire, our little kingdoms, our own choice. How do we know that? I know that. I have a holy. Suddenly, I'm threatened because, wow, this guy is good. Oh, this guy is growing. This guy is progressing. This guy is developing. This guy is maturing. And I'm not. I'm threatened. I become obsessed with my kingdom when I'm unyielding towards other people's ways. I become obsessed with my own little kingdom when I'm unbending towards change. It's always going to be this way because it has been this way forever. Then we're more concerned about our kingdom than God's kingdom. We live according to my will rather than God's will. Well, that's why it's revolutionary. Easy to pray. And when you pray, think about it and give it much thought and may it be much true when we pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now there's another thing. What is real praying? We ask for God's mercy. Now notice the shift from your your kingdom, your name, your will to our. You must say our daily bread. And so we rightfully begin with God's affairs and then our own affairs. And so after expressing our burning concern for His glory, then we express our need of His grace. Not to mention our needs at all in prayer is as great an error to allow our needs to dominate our prayers. You see that? We are not to allow our needs to dominate our praying, but at the same time, we're also careful not to mention our need to God when we pray. Now, there are three things we beg God for His mercy. Number one, food. Ooh. Give us this day our daily prayer. Some are shocked that when it's time to pray for our needs, Jesus begins with food. Now, bread is the literal translation, right? Bread, kinapai. And bread means bread. It means food. 
but it can symbolize much more than food. It symbolizes all, all of that that sustains us in this material and physical life. No, no. That's bread. And therefore, it's food, it's a healthy body, it's good weather, it's a house, it's a home, it's a family, it's good government, it's peace, it's a good economy. All of that helps us in order to sustain this life on earth. All of that is daily bread. So Jesus tells us to pray for the necessities of life and not really the luxuries of life. Jesus wants us to be conscious of our dependence upon Him moment by moment. That is why He says daily bread. Daily bread. That's the first thing you beg God for mercy. But the second thing is this, forgiveness. Verse 12 says, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Drop to verse 14. For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Those are heavy words. See, just as food is indispensable for physical life, Forgiveness is indispensable for our spiritual life. Sin. Sin is like a debt. And it cries out for payment. It cries out for resolution, for closure. And when God forgives us, He remits the penalty and then He drops the charges level against us. Not only does He make payment, but He resolves. He says, no more charges. Now the words that follow, also emphasized in verse 14 and 15 in the last two verses, need some explanation. The Father will forgive us as we forgive others. He will not forgive us as we refuse to forgive others. Now what do these mean? In my way of explaining it, I'll give you two words to differentiate two options in interpretation. The first interpretation is what I call entitlement. And entitlement claims that my forgiveness of others earns me the right to be forgiven. In other words, I forgive you, and because I've forgiven you, I have earned the right for you to forgive me. Entitlement. Now, that in itself contradicts much scriptural teaching. The other word is evidence. And evidence claims that God's forgiveness of us, the sinner and the penitent, results in a forgiving spirit. Because God has forgiven me as a sinner, in return to what He's done for me, I now have a forgiving spirit towards others. That is to say, once our eyes have been opened to see the enormity of our offense against God, the injuries others have done to us, the offenses and the hurts appear by comparison extremely small. If however we have an exaggerated view of the offenses of others, you know, we make them big, it proves that we have minimized our own sin. Augustine called this text a terrible petition. He pointed out that if you pray these words while harboring an unforgiving spirit, you're actually asking God not to forgive you. Well, you can say, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have trespassed, have debts to us. If you pray that prayer but with an unforgiving spirit, you're actually praying not the words you say, but you're praying what your heart says. Lord, don't forgive me because I have not forgiven yet. Ponder that for a moment. See, if you pray forgive our debts and refusing to forgive, a prayer that's meant to be a blessing becomes a self-inflicted curse. In that case, you're really saying, Oh God, since I have not forgiven my brother or sister, please don't forgive me. That's it. That's why 
the great English Baptist preacher by the name of Charles Spurgeon had this to say about this particular verse. He said, this, if you pray the Lord's Prayer and these particular verses with an unforgiving spirit, you have virtually signed your own death warrant. Your own death warrant. Because God won't forgive you. Because that is your prayer inside when you have an unforgiving spirit. During one period of his life, I remember John Wesley, that great English, who started the Methodist Church, on fire for God. He went to the United States, well, not yet the United States, an American colony, Georgia, state of Georgia. He was an itinerant missionary. He was preaching the gospel, and there he came across General Oglethorpe. Now, General Oglethorpe was a great military strategist, but he was also known to be harsh and brutal. And so they had a discussion. One day, General Oglethorpe went to John Wesley and he said these words. John Wesley, you know what? I never forgive. And in response, John Wesley said, Then sir, I sincerely hope that you have never seen me. I sincerely hope that you've never seen it. But you see, when we know we have sinned, when I know I have sinned, and then I know and I experience God's forgiveness for my sin, I can forgive you. No matter what. Because He forgives me no matter what. I can forgive you. So, that's what we learn. What happens when we refuse to forgive? I've listed 10 things, figuring out what happens. And many of them are in the Bible. Some are applications of what we find in the Bible. What happens when we refuse to forgive? Fellowship with the Father is blocked. Holy Spirit is grieved. Our prayers will not be answered. God leaves us alone to face our problems in our own power. The devil gains a foothold through our bitterness. We force God to become our enemies. We lose the blessing of God on our lives. We waste our time nursing a wounded spirit. We become enslaved to the people we hate. And you know what? Last 10. We become like the people we refuse to forgive. You know, sometimes having an unforgiving spirit feels good. You know what? Because you're on top of things, you know, you have this weapon against somebody that you don't want to release because that's a powerful thing. An unforgiving spirit. It's powerful. It feels good to keep it on. Right? But once you do that, the person you're so angry at will be exactly the person you are. And that is why we have revenge in life. We have retaliation, right? Because that's exactly what happens. You maximize people's sins. You minimize your own. I can't forgive you. But when you see God, and the maximum sin that you have is cleansed, nothing in this world can hurt you such that you cannot forgive. Nothing. Nothing. No matter how deep that scar no matter how hurtful it is, nothing if you experience forgiveness through Jesus Christ. There's a third thing. We, we beg God for His mercy for freedom, deliverance. Deliverance from the evil one. So it says in verse 13, Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You see, we need to be made clear. Deliverance from the evil one. That's hard in Tagalog. Iligtas mula sa masamang yun. But that's what it is. The evil one, meaning the devil, Satan himself. You see, God doesn't lead us to be tempted. Here it is Satan himself who is in view. Not simply evil in general. And therefore, a paraphrase of this could be, do not allow us to be led into temptation, that that temptation overwhelms us. 
but to rescue us from the evil one. That's what it is. What is the implication? The devil is too strong for any of us. We are too weak to stand up to him. But our Heavenly Father will deliver us when we fall upon Him. See, that is our weapon. That is our strength. It is prayer to overcome temptation more than it is to avoid temptation because we know that cannot be avoided. But it can be overcome. We beg God for His mercy over temptation. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let me close with a few thoughts to you. Two things. First is the audience of one. Just remember that phrase, the audience of one. Praying to the audience of one. When we go to our inner room, even though we're all together, remember we are not praying to one another. We are praying to God. And it's easy to think about each other in our praying rather than God Himself. When we pray, we only have one audience, the Father Himself. I remember a daughter in her room doing her bedtime prayers, and as she prayed, she got into the inner sanctum of praying. She started out quiet, and then she was crying, and then her prayers became loud, and the mother on the other side of the room did not hear what was going on in there. And the mother came in knocking and said, What's going on? And the daughter simply said, Mom, I was praying. What kind of praying is that? They're shouting? And the daughter simply said to Mom, Mom, excuse me, but I wasn't praying to you. I was praying to the Father and the Son. We didn't have those attitudes. We're not praying to one another, but to the audience said one the second thing to remember is this. Not only the audience of one, but the petitions of three. The petitions of three. Three petitions. And here's how it works. The opposite way of the Lord's Prayer. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Forgive me. The second prayer we need to remember is this. Thy will be done. Lord, have mercy. Thy will be done. And the third, glorify your name. You know, those three petitions is the very fabric of the Christian life. You can talk about all these things about discipleship and the new trends in church and church growth and all these strategies put together. There's only three things in the Christian life. Lord have mercy. Forgiveness. Second thing. Thy will be done. That's surrender. And third thing, glorify your name. Use me to be a light so that in me, Jesus might be seen. That's the Lord's prayer. And that's what we need to recapture in the church in our lives. Let's pray. Shall we pray the Lord's prayer together in English? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.